Hi everyone, my name is Matt Williams. I am the Access Fellow here at Jesus College in Oxford and I'm going to be talking to you today about the Thinking Skills Assessment Test or TSA. The TSA is used by us uh, at Oxford for a number of our degrees uh, such as Philosophy, Politics and Economics. That's the degree I'm most familiar with because I'm a politics tutor here and I've been involved with admissions at Oxford for PPE for about 10 years. Uh, we also use the test for economics and management, chemistry, psychology, so quite a range of different subjects. As the name of the test suggests, it is a test of your thinking skills as opposed to stuff that you know. So it's not, strictly speaking, a test that you can revise for in the sense that you need to learn a particular syllabus and be up to date on your knowledge. It is nonetheless a test that you can certainly prepare for and that's why it's a good idea to practice past papers and it's a good idea to run through them with other people in order to make sure that you know where your strengths and weaknesses lie. In this video I will go through how the test works, how we use it at Oxford and then I'll give you an opportunity to go through some questions from the 2008 paper, which is the first paper for the TSA. It still provides a good model of what you can expect. And we'll go through the questions one by one, and I'll show you my top tips for performing well on test day. So having mentioned strengths and weaknesses that you may have in thinking skills, now may be a good time to try and work out what thinking skills you do have and what you think may need to be honed in the next few days, few weeks in preparation for a test like this. So now might be a good time to pause the video, have a chat if you're with other people and talk about what do you think you're good at when it comes to thinking. So for instance, personally, I've always found it relatively easy to comprehend language and to make interpretations of language and to come up with and to criticize other people's arguments. So I think that's something that I find is a personal strength, but I absolutely identify as a weakness is my mathematical ability. And so when it comes to a test of my thinking skills, I'm already thinking about how I can best allot my time in order to cater to my strengths and weaknesses. Because what we're going to be talking about, first of all, is what the test comprises and it comprises different skills assessments and so it's a really good idea to just start by reflecting on what you think are your strengths and weaknesses so give yourself a minute or two have a chat about it be really honest and self-reflective what are you good at what are you maybe good at but could be slightly better at have a think okay let's start with the when and the what of the thinking skills assessment. So the when bit is easy. The TSA in 2019 will be held on the 30th of October. And you need to make sure that well in advance of that, you are registered to take the test and that the school or the place where you will take the test knows about it, has someone ready to invigilate for you and has all of those logistical matters sorted out. We're aware that in some parts of the UK, unfortunately, the 30th of October falls during the half term period. And so that can cause particular logistical problems. So please just make sure that you've anticipated those well in advance and you've got some contingencies in place. It's relatively easy to sort things out provided you leave plenty of time. I've even known people take this test at the British Embassy in Buenos Aires because they were away doing voluntary work in Argentina. So there are lots of ways we can get around various problems, but only if you give us plenty of time and plenty of warning. Okay, now let's have a think about what is the test. Now the thinking skills assessment is divided into two sections and there are three types of question that you will encounter. Section one of the test has problem solving and critical thinking components. And here you can see the scores from those two components in the 2018 exam that are being displayed here with these bar charts. Now the problem solving component is what in old money we used to call 
numerical reasoning tests. So those are your mathsy questions. They're also spatial reasoning questions. Critical thinking is uh, more verbal reasoning. So that is where you're given a, a clump of text and you're asked to explain what is said and to analyse what is said critically. The second section of the TSA will only be taken by some students. So for instance, those who are applying for philosophy, politics and economics will have to take section two of the test, but those who are applying for chemistry will not. So please make sure you know which part of the test you are and are not expected to be taking. Section two is an essay and you have 30 minutes in which to answer an essay question. Section one, you have 90 minutes in which to answer 50 multiple choice questions that are split between problem solving and critical thinking. So time management is absolutely essential. If you've got 50 questions in 90 minutes, that means you've got a little under two minutes per question. In fact, to be exact, you have one minute and 48 seconds in which to answer each individual question. And it's important that you time things very carefully because if you don't, you could end up running out of time and that could be very bad. Now that allows me to segue into why we use the thinking skills assessment as part of our admissions process and how we use the assessment. Now why do we use it? Well, the fairly obvious uh, answer is that we get a lot of excellent applications for degrees like PPE and economics and management and chemistry and we need some way other than just school grades to tell the applicants apart and we find the tests to be useful they're not the only information we use by any means so if the test doesn't work out perfectly for you that's not the end of the world at all but it is a useful piece of information we do take it seriously but we use it with all the other information that we take from every application so we'll look at your test scores alongside your school grades and alongside your uh, predicted grades and alongside your references from your teachers and alongside if you're invited uh, your interview performance so all of these pit bits together help us build a picture of you as an individual. Now why we use the tests uh, more deeply is because we don't feel we get sufficient information from school grades alone. School grades provide us with a lot of useful information as to the academic potential of incoming students but they are imperfect and one of the things that we are slightly nervous about is that school grades can sometimes not only reflect an individual's uh, skills as an academic, but they can also reflect someone's background and someone's privileges. And one of the things that's useful about tests such as the thinking skills assessment is that it uh, is an opportunity for people, especially people who haven't necessarily had the most advantages in education to show off their various skills. So that's an important reason why we use tests such as the TSA. Now let's talk about how the test is used by us when we're making our admissions decisions. Now the various sections of the test are marked by, uh, by different people. So section one is actually marked by Cambridge University. So as you can see it says at the top here that it's a Cambridge assessment. Uh, so don't get confused by that. Even though you're applying for Oxford, it is in fact the University of Cambridge that marks uh, section one. So they mark the multiple choice questions because what you'll do is you'll fill in a grid uh, with your answers for each of the 50 multiple choice questions. It's well worth taking a look at an example of the grid so that you're familiar with it and you know what you're doing and you feel comfortable filling it in. There's no point leaving any blank spaces on the grid. You're not going to be marked down for any incorrect uh, guesses. So even if you run out of time and you haven't answered all the questions, just put something down because it's better than leaving any gaps. Anyway, test is, section one is marked by Cambridge University. So they will give us these scores. And what they do is they weight each of the 50 questions differently depending on their difficulty. 
and that's how they come up with these fractions of scores because you would have thought that 50 questions would give you a nice round number but because they're weighted slightly differently that's why you get different scores and they give you a mark for all of the problem solving style questions and for all the critical thinking style questions and then what happens is that that becomes a composite mark of both which is described here by this bell curve so this is overall scores from section 1 in 2018 and as you can see and as is fairly intuitive the fattest part of the curve is towards the middle so that's where the median score sits the, the person at the 50th centile and what we do is that when we're making our admissions decisions so we're trying to work out who should we invite to interview and we're doing what's called shortlisting for interview is that we look we divide the scores up into quartiles so we split up the entire cohort for everyone applying for each individual degree into the 25% slots so the top 25% which is down this end uh, second 25% which is somewhere around here third 25% and then the the bottom 25% okay now that those mathematics are actually done for us by Cambridge so they tell us who it comes in which quartile it's important to note that the distinction between the first and second quartile is usually a fraction of one percent so it's often a tiny tiny amount which is why it's really important to prepare yourself carefully for this test because it could be that you are on the cusp of being in the top quartile and the difference could have been just one extra question answered correctly it can really come down to tiny details it can also therefore come down to just how tired you are on the day, how prepared you are, how focused you are. Given that you've got to stick at an exam in, in section one, you've got 90 minutes, 50 questions, that's just tiring. You know, this is certainly in part a test of perseverance as well as a test of your thinking skills. So for goodness sake, make sure you're well rested, make sure you've had a nutritious meal, make sure you're hydrated, make sure that your focus is at its absolute optimum because it really can make the difference. You will be competing, if you're applying for a degree like PPE, amongst about a thousand applicants. And to be sure that you're getting in the top range, you need to make sure that everything is on point, that you're absolutely prepared. Now, it's important to note that we will know where you come in this distribution, but that's not determinative of our decisions. So if, for instance, you come right at the very, very top of the pile, that does not guarantee you a place at Oxford. And even if you come in the top quartile, it doesn't mean that we'll definitely give you a place. It makes it highly likely that we'll invite you to interview and it's usually a good predictor of who gets a place, but there will be people that come in the top end of the distribution who won't necessarily be invited because they may not perform terribly well at interview. And there may be other weaknesses in their application. And conversely, if you're uh, coming down in the bottom quartile of the distribution, that's also not necessarily the end of the road for your application. There can be many good reasons why you may have come in the bottom part of the distribution, perhaps the test was disrupted, perhaps you were going through some difficulties in your home life at the time, perhaps you were feeling terribly ill. Uh, all sorts of things can happen. If any of those scenarios occur to you, it's very important that your school contacts the college that you're applying to at Oxford so that the, the admissions staff can know. What they'll do is they'll put a note in your file and then any academic that looks at your application will be well aware that your test was disrupted or was otherwise disturbed and that you should be looked at differently. So be sure to think about that very carefully. Now section two of the test is the only part that we mark in-house in Oxford. So it is the academics that will be looking at the rest of your application, your UCAS form, your teacher references, your school grades, all the rest of it, it's us that will be marking your writing uh, task. Now, as I've mentioned previously, not everyone who takes the TSA will be expected to, uh, to uh, write this. So if, for instance, you're applying for chemistry, then this will not apply to you. Please make sure you know which part of the test you are expected to take. I'll go through the essay task in more de detail later. The only thing to note at this stage is that it's us that mark it. We take the marking very seriously. It occupies a great deal of time, but it's not time that we resent spending. It's extremely important and we take it extremely seriously. 
uh, but it's just worth noting that that's the only part that we actually mark in-house, otherwise it's marked automatically uh, at the University of Cambridge. Okay, before we move on to looking at the particular questions, I think it's a good idea to let you have a look at the answer sheet. As far as I'm aware, this is what it will still look like. Oh, sorry, getting a bit of a pencil mark there. Um, so as you can see, you put your candidate number up at the top and centre number, date of birth, etc., your name, surname. And the instructions are to mark the answer clearly using a soft pencil. If you make a mistake, erase thoroughly and try again. Now bear in mind that the, these will probably be scanned by a computer, not by individual humans. So you do need to make sure you follow these instructions very carefully because it could quite seriously affect the marks you get. So for instance, if for question one you reckon the answer is A, uh, you might have to put a little circle uh, like that. Uh, and if you think it's C for two, and so forth. Now, as I think I've mentioned already, there is uh, no um, there is no mark against you if you make a mistake. So if, for instance, for question three, you put B, but it's not B, it's, it's D, that's fine. You won't get a mark, of course, you won't get a correct mark, but nor will you get deducted marks. Sometimes in multiple choice questions, you can be deducted marks for wrong answers. It's not the case here. And that means that you do need to put something for everything. So as you can see, you've got everything all the way down to number 50. If you just leave blank spaces, then you definitely won't get anything. Um, obviously, the optimal thing to do is to make sure you've got enough time to answer all the questions. But it may be that that doesn't work out for whatever reason. And in that case, uh, to be frank, you need to guess.